We're continuing with our study tonight out of the book of 1 Corinthians. We're in chapter 12. And just as a, a backdrop, when, you, when we study the scriptures, we, we understand and we're seeing, I hope you're seeing, that when it comes to the scripture, God writes the word of God for a reason. And what, what we find is that he's dealing with the first century church, specifically the church at Corinth, and he's dealing with a lot of issues in the church. And one of those issues, which, which is a big issue, is the division of the body. The division of the body. And what we find is that when the body is divided, it causes a, a plethora of different problems that happens in the church. Now what happens with our Bible is that we look back and we see how God dealt with Corinth, dealt with the believers there. And what that shows us is we see something about the mind of God. We see something about how, how God thinks. And we also see what God expects of us and how he wants to use us and how we should live the Christian life. And so I just want to, to say this, and I think it's so very important. When I, when I open up my Bible, I'm not just reading some words. I'm not just reading uh, somebody's idea. This is the word of Almighty God, and this is God revealing to me his ways. And what I'm finding is, is that for the life of the believer, as I follow the ways of God, what happens with that is that I get to know God more. It's a, it's a journey that continues. And see, here's the thing. My, my hunger for knowing his ways must rise to a level of passion that it overwhelms my lower passions. Do you hear what I'm saying? See, we all have to deal with these lower passions. But if there's a greater passion that overcomes the lower passions, it moves me in a direction. So here we are in Corinthians, and we'll pick up on verse 22. It says there, this is the New King James, it says, No much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unrepresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Now again, Paul is dealing with a specific issue in the church, and this particular issue is, is that the Corinthians, because they came out of a culture that highly elevated those who had vocal gifts and those who were prominent in their wisdom and in their philosophy. And so that mindset came into the church. They brought that same mindset. And what they were doing is that they were, they were elevating certain gifts. We even see in the early part of the letter that they were uh, elevating certain, certain ministers. Some were of Peter, some were of pa Apollos, some were of Paul. Some said that they were of Jesus. And so what was happening is that these, these, these fringes were causing schism and division in the church. And so Paul is doing what? By the Holy Spirit, he's correcting the church. And how you correct the church, you don't beat the church down. What is he doing? He's showing them the right way. And so here we see he's using the body, the physical body, as a metaphor, showing the Corinthians that the body of Christ operates like the human body. And he's saying that as the human body, you have, you have these, these visible parts of the human body, such as your eyes and your nose and your mouth and your hair, and people give a whole lot of attention to that stuff, right? I mean, we appraise people on those things, don't we? I mean, if that, if that stuff is something wrong with it, boy, we talk about that, don't we? I mean, that everybody, that's the buzz, right? <laughs> but Paul is saying that underneath the skin you have these vital organs and these, these particular organs that are hidden they are, not, they are not exposed nobody can see them but yet they have such a critical uh, part in the functioning of the body for instance you, I mean, your eyes can look as good as they want to look your mouth can sound as good as it want to sound but if you take that heart out nobody's going to do anything right? <laughs> so he's saying there that these parts that seem to be uh, ignored, they, they lack exposure. Nobody gives them any attention. Nobody realizes what, for, for the most part, what their function is. He's saying that's the, what keeps the body going. So he's saying that in the, in the body of Christ, you have those parts of the body that are not visible. 
No, they're not on the platform. They're not somebody that, that is out on the forefront. They're not what people hear or see. They're not what people usually are, 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 are use as a point of identification when they're, when they're looking at a, a particular group. Th these parts are hidden. But the heart of God says, in my body, these parts that I've hidden, they are no less. They are no, they're not to be marginalized. In fact, they're to be greatly honored. There should be an understanding that if these parts are not functioning, the parts that you see can't function. Oh, that's good, isn't it? Yes, yes it is. Yes. And so he's, he's teaching the Corinthians that in order for the church to be healthy, there must be what? There must be a clear understanding of the various parts of the body. And see, here's the thing. The world, the world does what? The world uh, elevates that which is visible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And God is saying to the church, don't be that way. Please have a deeper understanding that that which you can't see is the most valuable. So he goes on to say there, he says that there'll be no schism in the body. Because see, if you, if you, if you appraise one part of the body higher than the, another part of the body, that in itself will result in the essence of division. Because when I, that which I prize most means that which I will ignore or marginalize more, marginalize more. Does that make sense to you? If I lift up one side, I have to put down another side. Is that right? right. Now see, this is revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Because see, here's the thing. Naturally, people don't think like this. In our society, people don't think like this. And so God is saying his church lives from a, a much higher standard you, than the world. You, oh, this is good, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Okay. As we move on, uh, there in verse 26, he said, if, if, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, this is very important because he says he uses the contrast of suffering and honor. He says, if one member su suffers, all the members suffer. What does that mean? It means that, number one, if, I, um, if I'm aware of some, a member of the body that is hurting, I shouldn't go in that. I shouldn't be happy about that. That shouldn't bring any joy to me because a, a member is hurting. I should be doing what I can do to help that situation. I should be trying to partner. If, and and if, if I don't know nothing else to do but to pray, prayer is something. You see what I'm saying? I, I'm, I'm lending my faith and lending my heart to, 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 to approach God on behalf of that situation. So he says, if one part of the body suffers, all the body suffers. There is a sensitivity to the fact that my body, part of the body is hurt, as it would, as it would be in the, in the human body. He also says this. He says, here's another point. If one part of the body is honored, all the parts are honored. That's good, isn't it? Yes. So he's saying that when it comes to this idea of the body being honored, you know, we had a, just last Saturday, we had a, um, 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 what we had training from 9 to 12, and that we recognized the fact that we have uh, volunteer staff, we have full-time staff, but they're all staff. They're all members of this body that function in various times. And many, most of them, you don't hear much about. We have a cleaning crew that comes in here where nobody else is here. And they clean the restroom and they clean the facilities. Nobody sees that. Yeah. But see, we, what we do is we, we recognize them as being a vital part. Yeah. That which is not seen is vital. Right. And, and you know, I'm honored when I'm, when I'm in, in the building and those folks are here, I like to come up to them and just say, thank you for what you do. It is so important what you do. You see what I'm saying? Yes. That is so unlike the world. So th this idea, when all, when when the when when the when one part of the body is honored, the whole part is honored. So when the when faith outreach center receives honor, what does that mean? All those parts that come in here, when when nobody sees them, they're not on the platform. They're doing their, they're just diligently working, serving week after week, week after week. What does that mean? They are honored also, because without what they do, faith outreach center, just as a representative here, would not be what it what it what it would need to be. So he goes on to say, he says, verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. So he's saying, he's making this pointed and he's saying, you church of Corinth, you are to operate like that. You are the body of Christ. 
You are members. Christ is the head. You are members of his body. Therefore, you are to function like so. You are to function. And in fact, in the way you honor your parts, the various parts of the body, you recognize that without those parts of the body, you can't be what you're supposed to be. So this notion that only those who are the, the, the ones who are visible, those who are the high, are considered the highest gifts, they can't function without the other parts of the body. So, moving on from there, tw verse 28. And he says, and God has appointed these in the church. Now, he's going to shift a little bit because now he's going to start talking specifically about certain offices in the body. He was talking about certain parts of the body, and now he's going to start dealing with certain offices of functions in the body. And so we move into verse 28, and then he starts talking about, he says, first of all, you have the apostles. Now, the apostle, it is indeed an office. You can't make yourself an apostle. You can't become a super apostle. You can't become an apostle of apostles. You have to be... <laughs> You have to be called by God and placed in, the, in that office by God. That's the only way you can get there. Now, we understand that when we talk about the apostles, we had the, what we call the original apostles of the Lamb that God, Jesus Christ, chose specifically uh, himself. And no other apostles are in that class. Those original apostles were chosen specifically by Jesus. But then you have, since that time, you have other apostles, such as you have the Apostle Paul, who's in another class. Distinctly, he was given the, the revelation of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which he, which he penned most of what we know as the New Testament. And then you have other apostles outside of that. Now, some dear brothers, they say that uh, since the first century has ended and we've moved on, that the time of the apostles is over. The problem with that is that we can't find that in Scripture. I don't know where they got it from, but they got it from, they didn't get it from scripture. So what, what we know is that it is God who sets those in apostles. And in the day, today we have apostles, but God sets them. Right. And normally those who are apostles, just, just to give you a little hint, they don't go, they don't go around wearing a shirt and a t-shirt with their name on it saying that I'm an apostle. <laughs> but you can tell by the function. You see what I'm saying? You can, you can tell by the degree of a, a spiritual authority. You, de you, can degree, you can tell by the degree of, of, of spiritual power or experiences with Christ. Those things are typified. Those who have been called in that office. So you don't have to advertise it. If you are something, people will know it, right? Yes, yes they'll know it by your function. He goes on from there. He says, second, uh, prophets. Thirdly, teachers after that miracles. Now, what we have to understand about the context here is that he's dealing with ministry offices, ministry functions. And so what some people do, they get confused and they try and, and put something in here that is not. So we're just going to keep going because I don't have time to, to highlight every particular office. But he's talking about specific offices or ministry functions. So he's saying there are teachers. After that, there are miracles. What does that mean? It means that there, this probably relates more to the evangelistic office, but the fact is, is that this is a ministry function. This, this uh, gifts of working of miracles, I shouldn't say this is the office. So there's a particular calling of people who have a ministry in the area of miracles. Normally, that's associated with the evangelistic office. Then you have gifts of healing. Here's another ministry function that, is, that you find it associated a lot of times with the evangelistic offering, but not just the evangelistic offering. They could, it, it can also be associated with other ministry offices also. But the point is, is that these are ministries. Then he talks about helps. Notice, helps is a ministry. If you're called to the ministry of helps, guess what? You are in ministry. That is a ministry function, a ministry office that you're called to. He goes on from that. He says administrations, a variety of tongues. And he goes on to say, he said, now he asks us the question, are all apostles? And the answer would be there, obviously, no. Are all prophets? And the answer would be, obviously, no. Are all teachers? And the answer would be obviously no. It's interesting when you when you go to churches or groups of people who are who are babies in the Lord. Everybody wants to be what? An apostle, a prophet, or a teacher. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> I go out to the unit and it's, it's amazing. 
you know, everybody out there, I shouldn't say everybody, but just about everybody. Everybody is a pastor. Everybody is a teacher. Everybody is an apostle. You know, you, you get that. It's interesting. He goes on to there. He goes on from there. He says, are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? Does all have that? Do all have that particular ministry? No. Do all have gifts of healings? No. Do all speak with tongues? Now, here's where the controversy comes in. Because the context here is what? He's talking about ministry offices, ministry functions. These are ministries. So when he talks about tongues, he's not talking about tongues from the standpoint of when you receive, when you get born again, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and you speak in other tongues as the evidence. He's not talking about that. He's talking about a ministry function of tongues. There are people who have a ministry of tongues and interpretation of tongues. Or somebody might have a gift of giving uh, a ministry of utterance in tongues. Somebody else might have an uh, uh, utterance of interpretation in tongues. And sometimes you might have, the, somebody might have both gifts. Tongues and interpretation as a ministry. What does that mean? It means the Lord uses them in a public setting. Within the context of the church, you'll find out that God uses them pretty prominently in regards to tongues and interpretation. He gives them tongues or interpretation to have a, a message for the body. Does that make sense to you? So he's talking about this within the context of the passage. So he's not talking about something. Many, what people do many times, they'll bring me to this passage and they'll say, see that right there? Everybody's not supposed to be in tongues. Well, if you're going to use something, don't use this one, okay? Because this is not saying that. Right? So he goes on from there. He says, do, not, do all interpret? No but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Now, verse 31 has been confused because he says all that, and then he says, earnestly desire the best gifts. Now, when he's talking about the best gifts here, he's not talking about the idea of what is the, the best gift. Okay, get the best one, because if you're the, you get the best gift, you're going to be the best one, right? No, I mean, that can't be what he's talking about. Why? Because he spent, what, 28 verses saying don't do that. Yeah. Right? So he's not going to come down at the very end and say, okay, everything I said, forget it. Just do it anyway. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, does it? <laughs> no. No, he's saying that. He's saying the context here has to do, what is the best gift? The best gift is that which God has called you. You see what I'm saying? That which you have been called. You can't be anything else. And see, here's the problem. If you try to be something else, you become a misfit in the church. And you start messing everything up. Have you ever seen people who are out of place, how they act? They mess up everything. You ever, you ever notice that? So, so you want everybody, what, to recognize your place, right? Because that gift that God has given you is what? Is the best for you and also the best from the standpoint of how you function in the body, right? Because if you function on that which you have called to be and to do, what's going to happen is that there's, you're going to add to the body. But when you get people out of place trying to be something they're not, that's when the church gets messed up. Do you follow what I'm saying? I mean, the anointing dies, People are all confused. People, people, um, they, they get at odds with other because there's a, a spirit of strife that comes out of that. Why? Because you're stepping in an area where you're not. What I've learned in life is this. I've got a little bit of mileage on me so I can say this. Is that it's good to be in the place you're called to be. Oh, it's good. It is good. It's good. It's good. You don't have that extra pressure. You don't, you're, not, you're not acting like a misfit. I mean, you're, you're calm. You got peace. You got joy. I mean, it's good to operate where God has placed you. It's good. You know, you have these folks that say, well, you need to go out here and get you a shopping mall. Or get, I'm not going out there and do it, man. I'm not. God didn't tell me to do that. I'm staying where he has placed me. I mean, just crazy stuff. See, this is, this is why you get people, you know, running people down and, and, and almost ripping money off them because they need an offering because they've stepped out of place and now they're trying to get you to pay for it. So when you stay in your place, life is good. Isn't it good? So he's saying the best gift where God has called you. Where you're at peace and you flow and you, can, you, you, you have the presence of God and, and, you, and, and, and wherever you are, you're a blessing to that place. You're not, you're not something that's causing a, an uproar and, or, or disturbing. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what he's talking about. Oh, isn't that good? Yes, yes it is. Yes. So 
Now let's move on. Because now he's going to launch us over into chapter 13 because he's going to show us now that in, in the economy of God, here's what God is after. He's not after function. He's after the attitude that promotes the function. This is very important yes, because many times what happens in church is people look at function only. But see, function, whatever your gifting is, has to rest on your character. Yes. And if your character is cracked, it's only a matter of time where your gifting is going to be derailed. Do you understand what I'm saying? And see, here's the, here's the thing. Many times in church, people like to rush into stuff. You know, where I'm so-and-so. Let me put me up there and let me, let me, you know. See, they don't understand. You're opening up yourself for destruction. And see, this is why we, 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 we are here at Faith Outreach. We believe in bringing people along. You know, if, okay, you got, you, you, you got a gifting, you got a call. Okay, let's get this thing developed. Let's, get, let's learn some word. Let's get it, let's practice it in a safe environment. And see, that will pay you great dividends. Yes. It'll make life good. Yes. Are you listening to me? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So verse 13, chapter 1, I mean, chap, verse 1 of chapter 13, this is the love chapter. And so he says here, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clinging cymbal. Now he's talking to the church at Corinth specifically because he's saying to them, you're after these gifts, but here's what's happening to the church. The church is divided, it's splintered, you're suing one another. Some of you are functioning in sexual immorality, so you're not respecting one another. And then on top of that, you want to put the functioning of the gifts. He's saying that your, your attitude toward one another, your, your, this attitude, this, this, this disposition of love, God is love. He said that has to be the first order of business. Yes. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. God is very concerned, not just what I do, but how I treat you. Isn't that good? Let me say that again. God is very concerned about not just what I do, but how I treat you. You see what I'm saying? If I treat you wrong, it doesn't matter what I do. Oh, this is good. Somebody said, I got my ministry. Okay, I want to know how, how you're treating people. Do you know, I, 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 I was reading, and somebody told, and I'm not going to call any names here, but they were, this um, minister of the gospel, he said that he had, he had, um, heard about this, this great man of God and he said that he he had read after him and studied after him and listened to a minister and he was just so impressed with this guy and he said then he got the opportunity to spend some time with this man and he said when he did that behind the scenes he said it was the greatest disappointment of his life because he saw how this person treated people, people that worked for him and things like that, he saw that and he said it crushed him because the man had a powerful ministry, but the way he treated people was despicable. And he said he, he just, he, he just, he didn't want to be around this person anymore. What, what, what was that? See, the guy had a great ministry, great gifting, but his love walk was so disastrous. He had no respect for people. And so this is what Paul is saying. So he says, he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clinging. Some, there are many things that you could say about this, but here's the bottom line. What you do has no value if you're not walking in love, Amen. the attitude of love. Amen. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. And see, this is, this is very important, that, we, and, and I, I would say this, that as a believer, we need to keep this at the forefront of our thinking. God is very concerned how I treat people. I tell you what, let, look, let's look with me in Matthew chapter 7. Here's a, here's a passage of scripture that I think sheds a little light on this. In the kingdom of God, what really matters with God is relationship. Number one, the vertical relationship with him, and then the horizontal relationship that we have with people, right? Specifically the body of Christ. What we see in Matthew chapter 7, if you'll look there with me real quick, look at this. this I think this sheds a little light, and I'm going to start this in verse uh, 15. It says here, it says, uh, beginning at verse 15, beware of false prophets, are you with me? Mm -hmm. Which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. 
Ye know, ye shall know them by their what? Their fruits or their actions or the evidence of their life. Do men gather grapes or, or thorns or figs or thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a good, a corrupt tree bringeth forth corrupt fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire. Verse 20, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Verse 21, here it is. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Verse 22, many. Now when God says many, that is an astounding statement. God, when he says many, many, his many is macho, macho many in our regard. I mean, it, it, he's talking about a, a, a significant number of people. Significant number. He says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not, notice, they're, function, they're, they're emphasizing their function, prophesied in your name. In your name have cast out devils. In your name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, here's the point that I want to bring out. Whether these people were lying about what they did or not, but here's the point. The point is, is that when you come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he says, you can do all these things. You can speak in tongues of men or angels. You can um, um, uh, have the gift of prophecy. You can understand all mysteries and knowledge. You can have all faith. You can, that you could remove mountains. And if you have not love, I am nothing. What is that saying? It is saying that in the kingdom of God, if you don't function by love, whatever you do has no merit whatsoever. Which to me seems like that would put you in jeopardy when you stand before the judgment bar of God. Do you hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the, the weight of what he's saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he's not saying this as simply a suggestion that, you know, you better be nice to people. No, he's saying, listen, your works have no merit if your relationships are wrong. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, see, this, this brings out light why he says um, there in the book, he says in, in the teachings of Jesus, he says that if you have aught against your brother, he says, leave your gift at the altar and go make it right. Yes. Because God is very concerned about relationships. You follow what I'm saying? Yes. So see, what this says to me is that I need to keep my heart right. I need to keep my heart right with people. I need to keep stuff straight. Because if I just rest on ministry function, that has no merit. And that's difficult for people to say because most, most people, we, we're, you know, we like to sort of be like the world. You know, this is what I do. Well, the question becomes, God is more concerned about who you are than what you do. So he goes on to say, he said, verse 3, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned. Now, in, in, in the first century time period, as it is in our day, there were people that would actually sacrifice their bodies because in some of the, the heathen um, uh, religious practices, they would literally offer their bodies and burn their bodies. They would even burn children on altars such as Baal as sacrifice to God. And he's saying here, even in the context, because the Corinthians knew exactly what he was talking about, he's saying that even if you could give your body, what a sacrifice. It has no merit. So you could see this would shock the Corinthians. So, okay, let me keep going. So, and I give my body to be burned and have not love. It profits me nothing. Let's move, move on. We'll close this out here. So he moves on. He defines this idea of what happens without love. And then he moves in and he's going to do what now? He's going to find, divide, define for us the operation of love. He's going to contrast it. He's going to contrast it with that which love does on a positive note and that which is not of love, that which is the opposite of love. 
That's what he moves into as we move into verse 4. So he says, he said, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. In other words, it doesn't brag about itself. It's, <laughs> it's not puffed up. Does not behave unruly. Does not seek its own. It's not provoked. Think it's no evil. Let me stop right here. Somebody said, well, that sounds like a lot of me. Here, here's, here's what you have to understand. All of us have a human nature. Galatians chapter 5 calls it the flesh. What does that mean? Out of the human nature, there will, there will emanate impulses, drives, passions. My responsibility is to understand that these drives, passions, these, these impulses are the flesh. That's the flesh. So what does that mean? It means I recognize that it is of the flesh, right? And then what do I do? I don't let the flesh control me. I recognize this is flesh. It's flesh. That's what it is. So I call it flesh, and I subjugate flesh to God's word, right? To God's truth, right? So what does that mean? It means that when my flesh wants to rise up, and here it is, it will, right? It will. It will want to rise up at times. But I have to be the one who call it, yeah. right? Yeah. All right, flesh, shut up. Yeah. I mean, you get, you get thoughts about someone or something that are not right. You have to call it. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Listen, nobody's going to do it for you. Right. The devil will just come and help you. Yeah. So, I mean, you don't need his help. So you got to call it, right? <laughs> so, so, so. What, what are we doing? See, we're, we're, we're reigning, yes. right? We're, we're practicing reigning over the flesh because if I let attitudes, I let my dispositions, I let my, my impulses, I let my passions, I let my drives control me, what am I doing? I'm letting the flesh control. So when he talks about this, let's, let's face it. When we read, it's, it's one thing to read and thank God we can read it. But here's the reality. How, is this, how does this work in everyday life, Right? Because, see, here's the thing. You're going to have something because you have the love of God in your spirit, man. Your spirit, man, has the love of God in it. Yeah. Yeah. But your flesh will fight against that. Yeah. So I must be able to recognize it and call it what it is and deal with it. Amen. You see what I'm saying? It's like I tell people. See, my problem is not somebody. My biggest problem is me. Yeah. Right. Right. me too. Somebody said, I thought, I thought they were my problem. No, 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 no. Your problem is you. You're the problem. <laughs> so as we close tonight, God's word gives us instructions on how to walk out the reality of his divine truth. He, he shows us the, the church of Corinth because he's speaking to the church of faith outreach center and the church in our day. And this is the mind of God. See, here's what we're looking at. When you open up your Bible and you see his word, you're looking at the mind of God. That's the mind of God. And see, what that means is that I can't, I can't have an attitude where it's just the Bible. They're just reading the Bible. No, no, this is the mind of God. This is how God demands that I rise to this high standard of living. And so the word, the word is my substance, it's my food. Jesus said, man must not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's how I live every day. Yes. So now, if that's the case, my, my attitude toward this word has to be that which is, this word has to become that which is most important to me. This is where I get my perspective from. This is where I get my, this is what shapes my thinking. Do you follow what I'm saying? So here we are, here we are in a time where God has given us the answer to everything that we need. Amen.